This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. Global Connections at the 2 o'clock block here on a given Wednesday with our friend uh, in uh, Puebla, in the University of Puebla, which is uh, east, I think, east of, uh, of Mexico City. And he joins us by Zoom. And we are happy to talk to him today on Global Connections about the new populism in Latin America. Welcome back to your show, Carlos. Well, thank you, Jay. And, and actually, I'm joining you today from Mexico City. I've uh, trekked over here for uh, uh, for the day. I'm joining you to, to really reflect on some important changes happening in Latin America, the region that sometimes gets so neglected given all the drama in you know the Middle East and Russia and China. But it's such an important player for the world. Uh, Latin America has just Mexico and Brazil uh, 10 days ago. For Bolsonaro, a new populist leader, a right-wing populist, and, and obviously a variation that we'll say more about uh, closely connected to his interest with Donald Trump, and a uh, very interesting uh, you know, shift from the traditional leftist uh, orientation of their politics for the last decade or two towards the right. And in Mexico now, 40 days ago in December, they've inaugurated a new president, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, another populist from the left, a leftist leader who uh, both of these have some similarities in, in that they reflect a, a desire to really move away from the traditional political elite that have governed uh, there, but uh, very different, uh, one from the left in Mexico and one from the far right in, in the case of Brazil. Mm. So uh, I want to maybe just reflect on these two and, and get a sense of you know, what implications they're going to have for, for regional and global affairs, but also for the countries themselves, these two important Latin American countries. Yeah, we have a million questions. So how, how does this uh, populism, the left and the right, uh, differ? And how does it differ from Trump's populism? Um, and, and, mm -hmm. and I suppose I would also throw into, there, into that question, um, how are they affected by Trump's populism? Is this some sort of cause and effect here? It's an interesting question. I mean, uh, on one hand, uh, you could say, for example, the case of the Brazilian uh, uh, new president, he followed many of the tactics of, of, of Trump, uh, effective use of particularly social media and very, uh, you know, aggressive against uh, the, the establishment, uh, kind of an outsider. Um, and uh, it does reflect a trend beyond even Trump. We've seen in some European countries a rise of, of populist leaders, primarily on the right, uh, you know, that are challenging uh, the democratic uh, ideals and then pushing more authoritarian tendencies. Uh, and, and so the Brazilian case kind of follows us a bit. Uh, the, the leader, Bolsonaro, he's been a longtime politician, so he's not really outside of the system, even though that's how he came in. But he, um, in some ways, he uh, has he campaigned uh, sort of bringing a very hard line, anti-immigrant stance. Uh, in many ways, he has said some outlandish things, you know, saying that the military rule that Brazil left about 35 years ago didn't go far enough. And, and so he made some initial moves that are rather, you know, on one hand, troubling or you know, addressing uh, uh, a lurch to the far right. I'll, I'll articulate some of those in a moment. But the case of Mexico, uh, also a populist leader who is taking on the establishment, but in this case from the left, uh, a leftist leader because Mexico, uh, long governed by a one-party rule, uh, also experienced a brief uh, temporary shift to the sort of a right-wing party for about 12 years, but just now finished a, a, a president who came from the traditional party, uh, Peña Nieto. He left office. Uh, and so a different, a different case of, of the leader in Mexico, a leftist populist leader. Uh, but uh, again, uh, interesting to see parallels, but also real differences. Well, you know, this, this does raise the question of what exactly are we dealing, dealing with uh, in Mexico these days? I mean, it's very interesting. Next hour, the next hour, we're going to be talking to somebody who's uh, involved in an energy conference, a global energy mm -hmm. conference in Mexico's, Mexico City. Who knows? Maybe it's down yeah. the block from where you are. <clears throat> anyway, Mexico is, is, is arising somehow. You know, people think of Mexico as a, as a developing country, maybe a third world country. But in fact, Mexico has a lot of first world country attributes these days. Otherwise, you wouldn't be there, yeah. would you? And, and so yeah. what, I, what I'm saying is, you know, we need to understand more about Mexico to understand what's his name? A-M-L-O, AMLO? Uh, yeah, AMLO, the, that's the, correct. The president now. Um, to see how populism could surface this way and how Mexico reacts to what Trump and Trump's wall are, are doing. So what, what kind of a place, yeah. in that context, Carlos, what kind of a place is Mexico mm -hmm. these days? Is it advanced or does it have poverty and shortages? Uh, is it dangerous 
or does it have a rule of law? Well, um, all of the above, except the last one, the rule of law is a bit weak, uh, but it is a very mixed uh, you know, place. On one hand, a very dynamic and burgeoning high-tech and manufacturing sector, uh, and the NAFTA agreement now 25 years in place has really been a boom primarily to the north and parts of the central Mexico. Again, a deep level of, of integration and, and lots of economic growth. Uh, uh, so that's unquestionable. And yet uh, the criticism is that that process of liberalizing the economy now about 30 years ago uh, has also further deepened uh, the divide. There, There's an inequality that's quite substantial. So the southern part of Mexico and many parts of the urban areas, I mean, you have a large population, half the population that remains very poor, very sort of outside of even the formal economy, a large informal sector. So that divide has been a, a source of frustration, and indeed part of what's pushing for this uh, new shift to the left is a desire to address that, the inequality and in, the in, injustice. Now, added on to that, and, and it's interesting because, yes, there is violence, highest rates of murder, and obviously these organized criminal organizations we know, the narcos cartels, uh, even, you know, Netflix, a uh, high uh, um, popular uh, show at, at all. It is here. It's very real. And there are parts of Mexico where clearly the state does not have effective control. But then, having said that, there is still a, a very dynamic, modern, uh, you know, and I would say while there is crisis, in fact, in some ways, it's more of a country that's in flux. It's going through the motions of trying to address these challenges. Um, now, this new leader is, of course, uh, on one hand, supporters see it as addressing a lot of this corruption and incompetency and, and inefficiency and social injustice. Uh, some of his critics and detractors obviously fear that he might be lurching, you know, maybe comparing him to Venezuela, Hugo Chavez, you know, more state intervention, you know, reversing many of the market reforms. It remains to be seen, but certainly he is bringing some change. Some of it needed, some of it important, but uh, his own particular style is also, you know, called into question. He's very impulsive. He doesn't have a lot of, you know, detailed plans, but tends to kind of lurch one way or the other. But clearly he's taking on some very powerful vested interests, and that's not easy for any politician. And so it's been sort of a mixed bag so far. He's been making important changes, uh, trying to address even a, a, a Maybe a, you know, he represents kind of a, a very different kind of leader uh, outside of the traditional sort of politicians we've seen in recent decades. He's a more you know, plain-talking, frugal living. He cut his salary in half. He moved out of the presidential palace and turned it into a, an open sort of uh, new cultural you know, museum for the population to see. Uh, he's trying to stamp out corruption, but it's also, you know, it's one of those things you can't do overnight, and uh, it takes on some powerful interest. So uh, beyond that... Uh, so, again, AMLO represents this shift uh, for Mexico. Um, his focus is clearly more domestic. He hasn't been particularly interested in foreign affairs. He hasn't, at this early stage, he still remains, I think, fairly cordial in the relations with the U.S. He hasn't taken it on as a big issue. He's addressing more domestic issues, understandably. But nevertheless, uh, the relations with the U.S. remain still very you know, delicate. Uh, mm -hmm. Since Trump came to office, we've seen a very tense uh, situation given the, the crisis over the caravan, the migration, the wall, all of that. Uh, Mexicans obviously look, uh, you know, with a lot of disdain at, at, at the very critical of the words that, that have come from President Trump. So uh, they're also puzzled with, you know, how much further can that go? When will it, you know, change? Uh, so we're still in a period of U.S.-Mexican relations, but down from where they had been in previous years. Uh, but they're important. The countries are deeply interconnected, uh, and certainly in terms of trade and commerce. Or, I mean, uh, there's a lot uh, that connects the two countries and that will continue. Um, but uh, so Mexico, again, has a particular complex interdependence with the U.S. that doesn't exist with Brazil. Brazil is a bigger country, bigger industry. Like Mexico, again, very similar, complex, deeply divided society, a large population that's marginalized, but also a very dynamic, industrial, high-tech industry, major exporter. Both of these, we would consider them emerging powers. Uh, they are, you know, regional players, you know, Brazil in particular, part of the BRICS club, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, sort of a leader among the developing world. Uh, but these terms we hear, you know, third world developing world, they're not always accurate because, again, you can go to Sao Paulo or to Rio and have a very modern uh, first world experience, turn the corner just like in Mexico City, and suddenly you're hit with the reality of, you know, injustice, poverty, uh, in, you know, inefficiency. Uh, so it's a real mixed bag on one hand, uh, mm. but very important. These are countries that have a profound uh, trade, uh, you know, relationship with the U.S., with Europe, uh, and they are not going away. They're going to continue to be evolving, uh, more urbanized, large-growing middle classes. Um, I think because of these changes going on now, they reflect, you know, a lot of disenchantment with uh, corruption that's happened in recent years. 
both on the left and right, and uh, just a desire for change. So there's some parallels with understanding the phenomenon. Part of it is the individual. Part of it is this sort of changing global economy where obviously some people are being left out, uh, and you know that the, 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 maybe the story of a generation or two ago is suddenly not the same, and uh, there's a lot of anxiety there. Well, I, what I get is there's a common denominator here between Mexico and uh, even though the populism is in the one case left and the one case right, uh, the common denominator is that the people are dissatisfied. There is a big divide, yeah. um, and they're looking for a solution, and they don't mind. Uh, in fact, they will vote for somebody who's selling populism in, in each case, which yeah. is uh, sort of repressive, uh, autocratic, um, mm -hmm. not necessarily mm -hmm. rooted in the rule of law, a complete change, and mm -hmm. as one fellow put it to me the other day, disruptive. They, you know, they're looking for yeah. something yeah. that will disrupt the status quo. And I think it sounds from mm -hmm. what you say that that's a common denominator in both places and other yeah. places too. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, again, so taking on the establishment. Now, what that means is that while they both receive very substantial uh, you know, support, uh, AMLO has a majority now in the Congress with his own new party. Uh, he received the overwhelming majority, the same in the case of Brazil. I would say we have to understand it's not so much the excitement about them as individuals, although they each have their core base, but it's m as much a frustration with the political establishment and, and really a protest vote. Uh, this thing you could say with Trump's base. He's got a core base, but there were many who simply wanted to send a protest signal uh, to the traditional political elite. Uh, that is there. Uh, again, as we look at these two in Brazil and Mexico, it's just fascinating to see that you've got one model in Mexico pushing to the left, uh, addressing social justice, uh, trying to you know root out the, the corruption, but in a way that's kind of also opening space, giving a voice to those who traditionally have been voiceless. So that, on one hand, is good, but it also means trying to rule by... Uh, you know, in some ways by popular decrees, and that, that can be messy. Democracies, obviously, are supposed to be where you elect officials and let them make decisions, but in the case of Mexico, this new leader has, has already embarked on a lot of what he calls uh, consultations, like a referendum, but they're not necessarily done very well. A small percentage actually show up to vote, and then you're suddenly making decisions rather, you know, impulsively by uh, very complex ones. Uh, for example, a, a very large new airport that's being built here in the outskirts of Mexico City, a massive project, $10 billion, 30% of it's done. The new president comes in, calls a referendum. The people who support him overwhelmingly say, no, we don't want that. So now they reverse that, and, and it's a very messy polarizing process. Wow, that's process. messy, yeah. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, if it had been at the earlier stage, you might understand, okay, they're, they're deciding against it, but it's more than 30% done, and now the decision has been made to just stop it. Well, you can be assured that the business interests, so, you know, have contracts that they're going to get paid with, and, uh, and, and it's been uh, kind of sending mixed signals to the business community about what, what the new regime means. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the challenges, uh, you know, trying to rule in ways that, are giving voice to the voices, but often if it's not done well, it can also you, you can lose credibility and legitimacy by just you know moving forward with these referendums um, as, a, as a way of making public policy. Uh, but you know again, in the case of Brazil, a different side. What we've seen is more alarming uh, initial move. You know, uh, restricting uh, indigenous rights, uh, the LGBT rights has now been also taken away. Uh, eradicating a labor ministry, so eroding what had traditionally been maybe rights of different groups in society. Mexico, a couple of days ago, the president of Mexico decided not to join a large group of other Latin Americans to criticize Venezuela, in many ways taking the position that, well, it's their sovereignty, we don't want to, you know, uh, interfere with their domestic affairs. But meanwhile, Colombia, uh, Venezuela, other, I'm sorry, other neighboring countries, Chile, Peru, have all been very critical of the case of Venezuela because of its assault on on the press, on you know human rights, on on you know a range of issues. These are tough issues, uh, and uh, you know I, I can't be optimistic, but I'm hopeful that you know in this age of uh, media, we, we we also bring out more transparency because we can see more and more of what goes on, and and, and it's a pretty ugly underbelly once we once we open that up. Well, you know, years ago, I remember the uh, Organization of American States was it OAS. And of course, uh, mm -hmm. it, was, it was supported by the, the U.S. and, as I recall, by the United Nations as well. Uh, <clears throat> and the idea was to bring South America together and to make it a, a powerful and um, moderate um, you know, economy and a, a political society that was easy to live in and that would be a, collectively a force in the world. Um, 
sort of a United States of sorts where everybody cooperated mm -hmm. state by state. Mm -hmm. uh, that hasn't happened. Um, and in fact, so many governments have failed in South America. And in fact, American policy, to the extent there has been policy from president to president to try to help countries in South America, that's failed. It, it's gone off the side. It's been, it had, you know, it's had a 180, uh, you know, effect of what it was intended, if it was intended to do anything. What, what can the United States do? What can a leader, I mean, a, a, a continental leader, if you will, in South America do? Maybe it would come from, he would come or she yeah. from Mexico. Um, but, but what can we do to make, to make South America, Latin America, um, the kind of OAS that it was, it was hoped to be years ago? Yeah, well, OAS, uh, you mentioned the organization of the is, you know, still exists. Uh, it's, you know, obviously critical theater is relatively weak. It, it brings together all of the Americas, Latin America and Canada and the U.S. But here, a quick answer I would tell you is that the U.S. has a lot of baggage and, and is seen from Latin America as, you know, having had a long history of intervention, military interventions, uh, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, Haiti, on and on, you know, overthrowing governments in Chile, supporting right-wing authoritarian governments in the 60s and 70s. So there's a lot of baggage that quite often Americans don't realize. Uh, Central America, I mean, uh, deep uh, you know, entanglement there and supporting, you know, repressive regimes, et cetera. Um, somewhat less with Mexico. Mexico always a bit more autonomous, at least uh, after the 1920s. But that legacy has meant there's always a healthy skepticism about the U.S. Some uh, thought is down the escalator in some tower and calls out the Mexicans as rapists and murderers, and, and you know, it hasn't gotten much better since then. And so it's, it's not a pretty, you know, friendly. Well, you know, that's one. We're US. almost out of time on this, and I yeah. and I just want to ask you yeah. one more question that. That is a, sort mm -hmm. of an elephant in the room question. <clears throat> you know, yes. Trump has been called, and I mean, I think it's true by every indication, he's been called a racist. And, and part of that racism is, it, is against uh, Latinos south of the border. In fact, Latinos mm -hmm. in yeah. the country yeah. too, but that's not the issue right now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's trying to keep Latinos out of the country and claiming that they're, you know, they're not adequate human beings. Um, and, and it's quite offensive to me and I'm not Latino <laughs> but um, yeah. what about you what about the people in Mexico what about uh, AMLO um, if I were yeah. if I were you guys I would be really 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 ticked off with his racist yeah. remarks and policies are people irritated about that oh they are it's insensitive and so it's vulgar and so yes and yet seriously AMLO for example he has just kind of not bothered to waste his time on that. He's looking internally, domestically, and doesn't want, and he, he doesn't speak English, which is also rare for a Mexican president. The last 30 years, we've had these more sort of technocratic, sort of English educated. But he's kind of a, a, a different leader in that regard. Uh, but overall, the population looks at Trump and just shakes their head, like, you know, uh, you know this, this is not somebody who, who speaks well about us. And so there's a lot of disdain. I mean, let me finish with the final thought, is that ultimately the solution and the answer to the challenges here has to come from Latin Americans, and there is a growing regionalism you know, effort to address these challenges, maybe in Venezuela, again, regional pressure that's coming from them. They want the U.S. to be a, uh, maybe a, a, a constructive engagement, not intrusive, not calling the shots, not dictating the terms. And yet, at the end of the day, the U.S. has always had an asymmetric relationship. It is always the bully that pushes its way with Mexico, with Central America. So there's an asymmetrical relationship there that won't go away. Uh, but the hope is that maybe Mexico, uh, not Mexico, that the U.S. doesn't, you know, in fact, maybe stay out of the, you know, affairs more. Uh, and that's already happened. I mean, ever since 9-11, the U.S. has looked elsewhere, and Latin America has largely been neglected in U.S. foreign policy. I would say, too, it's uh, unfortunate because the cultural and economic ties are so important and they will continue to be. Uh, so there needs to be an awareness and an acceptance, but also maybe more sympathy and support. We're not getting it today from Donald Trump. We'll have to see hopefully post-Trump that there might be an ability to rekindle, uh, you know, longstanding U.S. Latin American relations. Well, we can only hope, you know, I'm, I'm right along there with you in hoping. And I, I actually wish I could attend your classes at the University of Puebla <laughs> so I could hear this stuff coming from you you know, you and your class on a regular basis. But I'll, I'll have to settle for this show, Carlos. That's Carlos yes, Juarez, yes, sure. <laughs> Global Connections for years and years. We do Global Connections. We are so delighted to be able to talk to him about all kinds of things. 
And two weeks hence, we'll do it again. Thank you so much, Carlos. Excellent. Aloha. Thank you, and aloha. Take care.